Hi, thanks for checking out today's sermon from Calvary Baptist Church in Lake Havasu City, Arizona. We are launching into a series today about us, where we'll be taking a close look at the core values of Calvary. Today, we are discussing our mission. You can grab the Life Notes now by visiting calvaryaz.com forward slash Life Notes. Now, here is Pastor Robert Smith. You can go ahead and have a seat. It is good to be with you today. And uh, my name is Robert, one of the pastors here. And uh, if you would like to follow along, you can open up your Bibles or Bible apps to the book of Matthew, chapter 28. And uh, if you're feeling adventurous, you can also open up to Ephesians chapter two. We'll be there a little later on in our message. But uh, Matthew 28, it's on page 993. You can go ahead and open up and get uh, your place settled there. And we're kicking off a new study for the last, uh, geez, I don't know, six months or so. We are in the book of Galatians. And uh, we're, we're changing gears a little bit. And we're gonna be in a study called About Us because we wanna talk about us because that's what it's titled. Uh, it's very catchy and original and unique. But hey, what we want to do is, is kind of pause and say, hey, there's some of you that are new. Let's talk about, hey, one, we're glad that you're here, but let's talk about who we are, what we do, why we do it. And there's some of you that are not new, and we're glad that you're here as well. And we want to pause and say, hey, let's talk about what we do and who we are and what we're all about. Because there's a reason behind everything. Even the things that we do, there's reasons behind the things that we do. If you, uh, you know, had a career where you worked hard, there was reasons behind that. You wanted to provide a better life for your family. You wanted to set up for retirement. You wanted to accomplish goals. If you're into fitness, you have reasons for that. You want to be in shape. You want to look a certain way. You want to be able to do certain things. Everything we do has a reason behind it. Even, surprisingly enough, our complaining has a reason behind it. You can go, why am I complaining? There's a reason for that. Uh, and what we want to do is say, hey, let's pause and kind of talk about some of our reasons as a church, why we do things. Because in Galatians, it talked a lot about churches and how they're to function and how we're to live our life as followers of Jesus. And so as we wrap that up, let's say, hey, what does it look like for Calvary then to go be a healthy church as God has laid it out? And, and how are we planning to accomplish that? And, uh, and so we're going to be talking, like I said, about uh, who we are, what we do, and, and more importantly, the why behind it. And I don't know about you, but I'm always asking the why questions. Why is it that way? Um, which apparently, as I've heard, was slightly annoying to my parents. And uh, so, you're, you're, you know, you're welcome to them. Um, but growing up, I struggled to follow the rules. Any of you with me just didn't like following rules? I'm still that way, to be clear. I struggle to follow man-made rules, but I'm working on it. Uh, but I, I realized along the way, if I could understand the why behind a rule, it got a lot easier for me to follow it. Because the why matters. The why is compelling. The why helps motivate us when we're weary. It, it unites us when we have different opinions. It keeps us focused on what matters. And so we want to talk about Calvary and the why behind we do certain things. And so we're gonna do that for the next five or six weeks and uh, kind of look at why we exist, which is what we're gonna do tonight. And that comes directly from scripture and talk about why we have some of the values that we do, why we do some of the things that we do. Uh, but we're gonna kick off by just saying, hey, why do we exist as a church, as an organization? And we're gonna find that directly in Matthew 28 as Jesus gives us uh, a commission. So Matthew 28, starting in verse 18, Jesus says this, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now this section of scripture has been known as the Great Commission, because God is commissioning his followers to go and carry out his mission to the world around them. This was after Jesus was crucified, after he was buried and resurrected. He had been walking as a resurrected savior among them before he ascended to heaven. These are some of his final words given to them. And in that, we find our why, why we exist, and, and this is where we get our mission. And so for us, the mission of Calvary is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Now, I'm sure you've heard that before if you've been here any uh, length of time. That is our mission, and we constantly repeat it because we believe that this is central to why we do everything, why we plan certain things, why we make certain decisions, why we exist. It's all to lead people to a place that they feel confident that making a decision to follow Jesus is the best choice that they can make in their life. And all of this is because we need God's grace. 
We are all in desperate need of God's goodness and grace in our life because the world around us is full of brokenness, full of evil and sin and destruction. And we can look around and see that, and, and sometimes we see it in new ways, sometimes we see it in old ways, but from essentially the entirety of human existence, there has been a need for God's goodness and grace. And I wanna look at Ephesians chapter two. I told you uh, that we'd be going there, page uh, 1159 if you've got one of our Bibles, because I love the way the Apostle Paul lays out our need for grace in Ephesians chapter two. So we're gonna work through the first uh, sections of Ephesians two here. The first four verses, it says this in verse one of chapter two, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and mind, and we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. It's pretty plain as the Apostle Paul lays out that without Jesus, that is what our life looks like. He says, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We often want to sugarcoat and, and gloss over our spiritual realities. We want to minimize sin. We want to say, oh, it's not that big a deal. We have excuses and we have justifications and reasons and scripture speaks plainly. It says, no, you are dead in your trespasses and sins if you're not in Christ. And see, this is the reality because we've been given the, the freedom to choose how we live our life. In fact, all of humanity has been given this choice. We get to choose if we follow God's order and instructions or if we do what we wanna do. And over and over again, we picked what we wanted. We picked sin and destruction and self-gratification and it has destroyed our lives. It has led us to that place where without Jesus, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. It's both the reality that we feel, but it's also the spiritual reality. Because scripture says that the result of sin is death, both physical death. We have bodies that have a finite period of existence because of sin. But also there's an eternal consequence there that scripture says because of our sin, we have earned the right to go to hell, a place eternally separated from God and all that is good a place of suffering and anguish because of our decisions to choose sin. But thankfully, that's not the end of either the story or this passage. I wanna pick back up because Paul says, we are dead in our trespasses and sins, but verse four, he says this. He says, but God, those two beautiful words of scripture, but God. God intervened in our story, God intervened in history, but God being rich in mercy, because the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and he's raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So the incredible good news is that salvation is found in Jesus. Because the great love with which the Father has for us, the, the incredible richness of his love for us, he devised a plan for us to find salvation. A plan where his son came and lived a perfect life, where he was falsely condemned and nailed to a cross where he was hung up and killed on that cross and buried. And thankfully, three days later, he rose. After having the weight of, of condemnation of the sin of the entire world placed upon him, he rose from the grave, showing his power and victory over sin and death and hell and making a way for us to have salvation. And the incredible news is that anyone, according to Romans, anyone who calls upon the name of Jesus is saved. So all we have to do is, is understand and believe that we are a sinner in need of God's grace and forgiveness. Understand and believe that Jesus is the son of God and savior of the world, that he died for us and rose three days later and make a decision to follow him for the rest of our life and we are saved. That's incredible good news. And, and I'm going into all this because this is why we exist because of this good news and message. 
In fact, the, what I just described is summarized as the gospel. That's the single word kind of summary of this good news of Jesus' death and resurrection for us. And the word gospel actually has linguistic origins in the phrase good news. Because at its core, this is incredible news. This is incredible good news about a God who loves us, about a God who wants to redeem our life, about a God who wants to give us hope and fill us with purpose, about a God who is present in our life and wants to help us. And because this is good news, this is good news that we must share. That's why Jesus said, hey, go tell people about this good news. Go and share this among all the nations because this is good news worth sharing. And it's this good news, as I mentioned, that drives everything that we do here at Calvary. You know, we, uh, I wanna connect some dots for you there. The reason we serve our community is so that we can show the unchurched a little glimpse of a God who loves them enough to serve them through our actions. We do Bible-based teaching and we unpack God's word every single weekend to help us understand God's plan of salvation and his plan for our life. We have kids in student ministries, men's and women's ministries, not just to put stuff on a calendar for them, but to prayerfully lead children and teens, men and women, to a life-changing relationship with Jesus in a contextual way. We celebrate baptisms, not because they're special in the water there, but because they symbolize someone moving from death to life in Jesus. We worship weekly here as a response to this incredible good news about a God who loves us. We encourage life groups because we are created for community and it's in that context that we can encourage one another to observe all that God commanded us. All of this comes back to the mission of the gospel, this mission of the good news that Jesus came to save us. And the mission drives all of it. And, and I wanna take a little, a little tangent here just uh, to, to share a, another why. See, as we talk about some of what we do and some of our activities, there's times where we share some facts and some, some numbers with you about our church and what's going on. Numbers like, depending on the time of year, we have roughly 2,000 people that worship in person with us across all of our campuses and several more thousand that, that worship with us online. How last year we had about 250 baptisms of people proclaiming their faith in Jesus in that public way. We share numbers like how we have about 100 life groups with roughly 1,200 people connected in them on a regular basis. Numbers that talk about our outward significance, like $850,000 last year given outside of Calvary to mission causes because of your generosity. Numbers like 450 plus kids sponsored through Compassion International by people here at Calvary. And we share these numbers, and, and one of the pushbacks that maybe you're feeling right now, but what we've heard is, well, Calvary just cares about numbers. They're too corporate and businessy, and they don't actually care about the people, they're just caring about the numbers. But can I share there's a reason behind the fact that we track and share these numbers, and it goes back to the mission. Because God has given us this mission to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus, to baptize them and teach them to observe all that he's commanded us to do. And the numbers are the way that we track how we're doing at that. It's our accountability of saying, are we being good stewards of the opportunities that God has given us? Because the sad truth is not every church is doing that. You know, we, if you don't know, we're affiliated with the Southern Baptist Con Convention. That's our denominational affiliation. And uh, I read a study from 2022, so it's a couple years old, but in that study, it said in that calendar year, 45% of Southern Baptist churches did not baptize a single person in that year. Now, some of those are, are new churches. They're getting started, surely. But there's roughly 50,000 SBC churches, which means roughly 22,000 churches in our tribe did not baptize anyone. And, I, and I'm not sharing this to beat up on other churches. We are always looking for ways to serve and help other churches be more effective. In fact, Pastor Chad has been gone for a full week and he's still gone coaching and mentoring and developing other pastors. And, and it's something we're very passionate about. But I look at statistics like 45% of Southern Baptist churches not baptizing someone I really wonder if they can say they're being faithful to the mission that God's given them if not a single new person is professing faith in Jesus. 
And so we share these numbers with you as an act of accountability of saying, this is how we're doing at leading in our community, at leading by example, because you guys are trusting us to lead this church well. You're trusting us as your pastors to make good decisions for, for what we're doing, for how we're handling the finances, for how we're representing Jesus in the community. And we're both responsible to Christ and to you guys for that. And so those numbers, they're not there to boast and to, to say that we're better than other churches or to, to reduce people to a number, but just as an act of accountability saying, this is how we're doing at the mission. This is, this is where we stand with the opportunities that God has given us. But here's the other thing that we need to understand. This isn't just for pastors. Because this, this mission that God has given us is actually much more of a team sport. We have to understand that we accomplish this mission together. As much as you need uh, us as your pastors to lead and teach and encourage and guide you, we need you as the people of the church out in the community interacting with people, working to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Because the fantastic news is you guys know and interact and have a relationship with people that would rather die than come to church with you at this present moment. <laughs> and so God has you in those opportunities to slowly but surely change that fact. And there's people that you know that don't wanna talk to a pastor, that don't wanna come to church yet, and so you have an incredible opportunity to be a part of this mission, to be active in leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Now you might be thinking, well, I'm kind of new at this, I don't have all the answers, I don't know how I can do that, uh, I, don't, I don't know how I would field some of the questions they would put my way. Or maybe you've been around church for a long time and you hear me say that and you're picturing something that does not sound like fun. You're picturing that that means you have to go on the mission field and go overseas somewhere and you're like, I like the United States of America mostly, uh, but I don't wanna leave here. Or maybe you're thinking of a picture like what, what my church that I served at in seminary was like where representing Jesus meant going door to door with some pamphlets and diagrams and talking about Jesus on people's porches like a solicitor. I mean, we're Jesus solicitors, but I don't feel like that's much better. And so what I wanna do is say, hey, what if it didn't look like that? What if living on mission was a lot more approachable for all of us? What if living on mission for Jesus and being present in this mission of leading people to life changes something that could just happen in the normal rhythms of our life? And so I've got three ideas that are along in that of what it might look like for us to live on mission for all of us to say this is what it might be for us to live on mission for our community for Lake Havasu, for Parker and beyond, what might that look like? The first way that we live on mission is by serving. Serving is not only a, a core part of our strategy as a church, but this is very central to the plan that Jesus has for each one of us to live our lives by. When you look at scripture, Jesus is continually serving but he even specifically teaches this. Uh, one of my favorite sections is in Matthew chapter, or sorry, Mark chapter 10. And uh, two of the disciples come up to Jesus and they're like, hey Jesus, like how can we get like a special seat in heaven with you? They're trying to get position and trying to find greatness by some elevated stature and position or title. And Jesus tells them that they have it all wrong and all backwards. And he says this in Mark 10. He says, it shall not be so among you because this is how the world does it. He says, it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus says, hey, we look at greatness backwards. And the way that we find greatness according to God is by serving people. And he says, this is the example that I've lived with as Jesus. He says, this is my example for you. And I can't help but think about how the son of God and savior of the world, the king of the universe could have had a very different vibe and presence about his earthly life here. Like think about what we might design. If we were the God of the universe and coming to earth, what our arrival might look like. There might be parades and confetti and fireworks. There'd be people like waiting on us hand and foot. We'd be like not walking, but kind of like floating around because someone would be carrying us. We'd have great food. We'd do all these amazing things and there'd be a lot of noise. And it's pretty different than how the son of God and savior of the world 
actually arrived into our world. How he was born in a small town to some nobody parents as a baby, a humble, helpless child. How he spent 90% of his life in relative obscurity, just working faithfully as a carpenter. How when he did begin to serve in a public way, he spent much of his time helping the poor, feeding the hungry, healing the sick, helping the people who were the nobodies of the society. In the culmination of the, the incredible life of the most important person who's ever existed is a public, shameful, humiliating death on a cross. Jesus lived his entire life without any entitlement or self-seeking nature about him, but he lived his entire life as a servant. And he said that we're to do the exact same thing. That if we want to follow Jesus, it means us living as servants to the people around us. So let me ask you, are you living as a servant? Because this is a way that we can live on mission to the world around us, because this is countercultural to the world that we live in. So are you living on mission by living a life as a servant? Now, there's a couple ways you can do this. You could do this event-based, and you can sign up for a specific thing with us or with another organization. You can say, hey, I'm going to put a date on a calendar where I'm going to serve. Maybe you build a house with us in Mexico, or you sign up to serve on Main Street next month, or you bring in some candy for that. Maybe you sign up for a youth trip, and you go as a chaperone, or you serve at summer camp, and it's a one-time thing. Or maybe you sign up on a more regular basis and you say, hey, I'm gonna be a weekly volunteer and there's hundreds of you that serve every single week in different capacities, making incredible ministry happen here at Calvary. And that's wonderful. But I think what God is calling us to is for us to live with the identity of servant. It's not just a single moment we put on a calendar or one day a week that we're gonna serve but every single day, all throughout the day, we're gonna look for opportunities to live as a servant of the Most High God. And we're gonna look for ways to serve in our family by, by loving and serving and forgiving them. We're gonna serve people at work even when it's not our department or responsibility. We're gonna serve people in the community looking for ways to represent Jesus. We're gonna serve our literal neighbors when we have opportunities. Are you living your life as a servant because Jesus has called us to live with that identity? Secondly, if we want to live on mission, it means being people who are inviting others. You know, Jesus had 12 disciples, and and you're probably aware of that, but do you know that not all 12 of those men received a direct invite from Jesus? How'd they get there? They just like hitch a ride? They like slide in? No, they were invited by other disciples. So Andrew invited his brother Peter. That turned out to be a good decision. Peter made a slightly significant impact in the church over the course of history. And also, we see another story of how uh, Philip invited Nathaniel. John chapter 1 tells us what happened. It says this, The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we found him of whom Moses and the law and all the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come of Nazareth? You might have a city that you'd fill in the blank there. And Philip said to him, come and see. Come and see. That that small invitation completely changed his life. And all throughout the Gospels, we saw the same thing happen. People would meet and encounter Jesus, and their life would be changed, and they'd go and tell others, come and see. Come and meet this Jesus, because he's changed my life. And so throughout the years, we have encouraged you to be people who are inviting others, inviting your friends, your family, your neighbors, your coworkers, the people you have connection with, to just come and see who Jesus is to come to church with you and see what God is all about, to just give him a chance to show up in their life. And so let me ask you, are you regularly inviting others? 
And there's different levels to this. It can be the person that you just met, maybe at a business or in the community or selling something on Facebook Marketplace and you get that total stranger effect and you go, well, let's redeem this awkwardness. But you get those opportunities at that level to just say, hey, do you go to church anywhere? I go to Calvary, you should come with me sometime. But sometimes that invite is more personal. Sometimes you know the person, you know what they're walking through, you know the struggles that they're facing and you know how the power of God could transform their life. And you get to speak hope and truth into them and say, hey, why don't you come and see what Jesus can do for you? And you can hopefully be a conduit of God's grace by just offering an invitation. And sometimes it's even more intentional and in-depth. Sometimes you share your story of how God changed and transformed your life. You share what your life was like before Jesus and what it's been like after, and you invite them to come and see, maybe even in that moment, to make a decision to follow Jesus. But no matter where you're at, we all have an opportunity to invite. And it goes back to that question, if this is such great news that has changed our life, why wouldn't we invite people to come and see for themselves? Why wouldn't we invite people to come and meet a God who loves them and can change their life? So if we wanna live on mission, we need to serve, we need to invite, and finally, we need to really look at our life and decide if we're truly living for Jesus. Because as I mentioned, we all have free will. We have the decision to determine what motivates our life. And our life can exist for our purpose, our agenda, our desires, or it can exist to serve God and to follow his priorities and agenda for our life. And if we want to live on mission, we really need to ask ourselves, who are we living for? Are we living for God or are we living for ourselves? Because if we're willing to live for God, we have an incredible opportunity to change the world around us. In Matthew chapter five, Jesus says that, that he has given us this opportunity to represent him like salt and light of the earth. And he says, if we're willing to live for him, it can change everything. He says this, he says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So let me ask you today, are you shining the light of Jesus in the places and opportunities that he has for you or are you putting that under a basket? Are you shining the light of Jesus in your family, as I mentioned, by loving, by serving, by forgiving, by living like Jesus in front of them? Are you shining the light of Jesus in your workplace by refusing to gossip, by living with character and working hard and representing Jesus well? Are you shining the light of Jesus to your friends by living with grace and letting your faith be present and active in your life and serving them? Are you letting your light shine for Jesus or are you putting it under a basket? I love this timeless parable of Jesus, this analogy, because the truth is that our world can be dark. It can be filled with darkness that seems incomprehensible, but the incredible truth is that there is no darkness that can overpower light. And the gospel is that. No matter how broken and dark a situation may be, the gospel can bring light and hope and transformation into it. And the, the places that God has us, our, our friend groups, our families, our workplaces, they may be dark, but they may be dark because we're putting the light of Jesus under a basket instead of letting it shine and transforming that place. So today, our hope for you is that you would join us on mission, that you would live out your faith and live regularly on mission for Jesus and that in doing so, it would transform not only your life, but the community around us. Because this isn't something that just the pastoral staff can do, but this is something that we have to accomplish together. So our hope is that you would make the decision to live on mission by serving, by inviting, by making sure you're living for Jesus. And if you do that, I know that you'll get to experience the joy of living in the good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, as Ephesians says. So today, 
I hope that whatever you do, you decide to live on mission for Jesus. Let's pray together. God, we are thankful that you use imperfect people like us to accomplish your perfect mission. And sometimes we may feel inadequate for the task. Sometimes we may feel like the, the task is too big for just one of us, but it's because it was never designed for just one of us. It was designed for all of us to regularly be shining your light to the world around us. And so I pray today that you would lead the way for Calvary to continue to reach the lost of Lake Havasu and Parker and beyond, that you would continue to lead us to make a difference for Jesus in this place, but also that you would continue to lead the people that make up Calvary to understand that we accomplish this mission together and help them to live on mission. Whatever that looks like for them, whatever their context is, whatever situations they have the opportunity to shine the light of Jesus, God, I pray that you would give them the direction, the courage, the boldness to do so, so that our world can look different, so that we can walk in the good works that you've prepared for us to do. And we just pray this all in Jesus' name, amen. As Robert said, to accomplish the mission, we need to serve our community, invite others to get involved, and live our lives for Jesus. Well, thanks for listening to our message today. I invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel by visiting youtube.com forward slash Calvary LHC and hitting the subscribe button. That way, you'll be notified whenever we have new content and you'll receive our daily devotionals known as Your Word for the Day. You can also sign up on our homepage at calvaryaz.com. Well, that's all for today. Please join us again next week. Bye-bye. Are you looking for a way to dive deeper into scripture and make it a part of your daily routine? Check out Calvary's Word for the Day daily devotional videos. Visit calvaryaz.com forward slash D-E-V-O and sign up to receive these three to five minute devotionals right to your inbox each day. Our team of pastors and leaders share meaningful insights from the Bible to equip and encourage you in your faith journey. Don't miss out on this opportunity to grow in your relationship with God and connect with the community of believers. Sign up today and start receiving your daily dose of scripture.